Oh man, it's going down, it's going down, it's going down. <laughs> Sound like a Nelly song. Hey yo, so it, 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 this is this is a big deal to me. Uh, my next guest or guest, I'm nobody. Just go on. Hey man, look, I got I got one of my favorite fighters growing up. I got Kelly Pavlik in the building right here. Thank you for having me. Along with James Dominguez, y'all have a the, the show's called The Punchline, correct? Yep. Right. All right, so I hear, I, I'm gonna get right to it. There's certain moments that that stay embedded in people's heads, right? There's certain things that you never forget. And me growing up as a, a, a Hispanic, you know what I'm saying, a traditional Mexican family, there's only three things that brought us together. There was uh, birthdays, holidays, and fight nights, mm -hmm. right? And there's certain fights that just stay embedded in your head forever. Mm -hmm. And one of those fights happens to be one of your fights. It was against Jermaine Taylor. I remember exactly where I was at, by the way. Man, that was that was one of my favorite fights of all time. I remember screaming up and down the hallway. It was like, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> oh, he knocked him out. He knocked him out. So, uh, man, I'm happy to have you here, man. Well, that's cool, man. I appreciate it. Man, I'm going to get right to it, man. You know, it's been some time since that happened. And, uh, you know, there's nothing off limits on this show. So we, we want to get to it. You know, I'm, I'm a big component in talking about, like, CTE, talking about, like, you know, the, like, just that subject yeah. in general absolutely you talk about jermaine right you know like obviously his pattern of behavior over the past few years i mean what are your thoughts on as far as like that aspect of you know cte jermaine taylor hand in hand i don't know because you know a lot of times things are thrown around too easy too and there's all anymore this day and age there's always an excuse for something but i also see that if, through football boxing you know there is studies and there's proof that there's issues that stem from boxing or, or head trauma in general, no matter what sport. So um, some of the behavior, yeah, it was pretty bad um, on his part. I mean, I know people are going to say like, well, you're one to talk, but you're talking about two totally different things. And uh, Jermaine was really went out kind of on a deep end. And, uh, you know, he never did that before the Arthur Abraham and Carl yeah. Frosch fight. So I know everybody tells me that it was because of my fight, but I said, don't put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby. <laughs> um, you know, so I think there is some truth to it. I mean, after the three brutal knockouts that he, he took, um, you started seeing that, you know, that the behavioral patterns and everything else change. I know Jermaine Taylor is a great guy. You know, he really is. Um, he was always polite. He was always um, well-mannered treated everybody uh, with respect. And then you see after three brutal head traumas that he, that he taken that the difference in what happened, you know, how he behaved. So I don't know. I mean, there, there is some truth to it. And I, and I think it's a serious subject. I think it's uh, a big issue in boxing. I don't know if it's so much that people wish that evil on you. I think that there's, I don't think that he ever really recovered from the loss to you. And then you see that happen and it's like, one after another after another and it's like oh man like, what happened to miranda after you he was wanted by interpol right yeah there you go <laughs> but <laughs> but you know um Damn. but going back on that jermaine fought uh you know he went on he won a world title i know it was against uh sam solomon but um he also fought a guy like carl frotch which everybody other than me puts up on on the <laughs> pound for pound list as one of the best super middleweights and jermaine went in there he beat and, him almost the whole fight. And put a whooping on him. So was he ruined? I, I don't think so. I mean, I just think that we always knew Jermaine had a hard time at the end of a fight with his conditioning. Um, but he was up so far ahead on that in that 12th round in that fight that if he would have took one more knee, I still would have gave him the fight. You know, then you go back to Arthur Abraham. He was beating the crap out of, after the Frotch fight. He was beating the crap out of Abraham, too, for the entire fight until the later round. Um I don't know how much I may have took uh, taken out of him, but he came back and he he boxed great. I mean, he he put a whooping on Carl Frotch, who was the top dog at that weight class. Did you ever, have y'all seen videos of him like, like, like the last series of uh, videos that surfaced of him online? Yeah, like, you see, you see how abnormal he looks. I mean, yeah. it's it's like it it's not the same guy, you know that at all. And yeah. you know, I just wanted to bring awareness to that. But speaking of like 
your career. <laughs> so <laughs> I remember uh, you, you talk about Edison Miranda. I remember that fight. And you remember back in the day when H HBO used to do those those video packages where they mm -hmm. would take you through their whole entire life. And it's like you feel connected to the fighter. I remember they ran a package on Edison Miranda. So I was actually going for Edison Miranda. Yeah. And I remember watching that fight. And boy, you whooped the hell out of me, man. <laughs> oh, well, that's interview's <laughs> over. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> you know, whooped the hell out of him. And that's whenever I became like a full-fledged, you know, Kelly Pavlik fan. And like I mentioned to you uh, prior to, you know, us rolling, it was like, Damn, Kelly, like, I remember in 2011, maybe 2012, I had just set up my Instagram and you had an account on mm -hmm. there. And I, rem I remember uh, getting on there and I saw your page and I left a comment and you replied and I was spazzing out. I was like, no. oh, shit. You know, Kelly Pavlik replied. And at that time, I think you were already kind of like, you were out of the game. Yeah. And I, I didn't know where you were at. And then I said, like, you know, prior to this, like, probably about a year ago, I saw, you know, a, a YouTube interview on you with Joe Rogan. And it's like, oh, shit, there he is. Yeah. And. So, you know, first and foremost, it's so good to see because I think there's a lot of rumors and misconceptions like what happened to Kelly? Like you hear these, these, you know, these, <laughs> like, did, did yeah. he go off the deep end? What, what happened with him? You know, and it, it, it is like that. Uh, you know, there, I have made headlines, but it was petty things. It really was. I mean, if I really tell people, especially coming from the city of Youngstown, where it's, you know, uh, one of the most economically depressed areas and I'm in, in the headlines for you know, at one point, actually, the BB gun, the BB gun incident, um, you know, there was... I don't think they know. 12 indictments with all the local politicians. You know, there was like 12 felony counts against all of them. And they all got off and put a smack on the, on the hand. And the headlines was Kelly Pavlik BB gun. <laughs> wow. You know, um, four-wheeler. You know what I mean? Um, at a concert, dancing like a mosh pit metal concert with a buddy and it turns into that I was fist fighting him. Um, <laughs> you know, so those are the things. And, and those four years or a couple of years after I retired, I was done, you know, going into it. You brought up a good point about the CTE and, and the, the head uh, issues and stuff in boxing. Some guys will fight to their 45, 50. And you have guys like Robert Garcia, Mancini from Youngstown who retired at a, at a young age and had only 34 fights. Um, for me, Boxing wasn't a longevity sport, and it wasn't something that I seen myself in. And when I won the world title, I was actually counting down to retirement when most people are, are counting the next big fights. And um, I always wanted to make sure financially I was set, you know, especially for my kids and, and family. And then after I retired, I was I was done with it. I mean, there was a, are we allowed to swear? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, there, there, there was a lot of shit that had taken place. And again, I'm not I'm not going Kelly's the victim. I was childish. I, I acted childish, and then I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I I, I had fun, you know. You're a and, rock star, and man. It, it went in some of the stuff. Probably for being a, a person in a public eye, it's you know because I I have a hard time with that. I, I think that the more successful you are, the less you can do, and I'm not a fan of that. I think that everybody should be able to live their life how they want to, and it's no different than a person who is working every day and drinking their weekly pay away in Youngstown, you know what I mean? To point the finger. Uh, so that's what kind of uh, makes me mad. But again, I'm also not saying that I was, I wasn't childish. So when I, when I just started doing that, you know, this couple of years out, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I know I didn't want to be involved in boxing for a period. I didn't, not forever, but I just wanted to take a break from the sport. And then, you know, the last uh, four years, I turned, you know, I said, okay, you know what? I'm tired of sitting around and not doing anything. Um, I have my family. I'm blessed with that. And I'm blessed that I had the right people, a team, the right team behind me to where I never had to fight again. I didn't have to go throw a punch or get punched in the head again. And I'm able, to, you know, and I did well enough to where I could make investments and do things at my own time, my own pace. And I've, and I've been in a handful. And uh, now that's why you started seeing me you know, back out there again because I got off my ass. Well, you know, and, and I, I guess, well, first off, I know you speak of your family. How many kids do you have? I got two. How old are your kids now? My daughter will be 14, and my son actually uh, just two days ago turned 11. Oh, wow. So, yeah. you know, uh, so the reason I ask is just because whenever you you go back to when you win the, the middleweight title, it was a big moment. I, I know that it, it had to be a high like no other. Um do you did you ever struggle with fame? Did you ever like 
was it ever too much? Like, damn, I'm, you know, because especially being from Youngstown, you're, I mean, for lack of better words, you're the man. Yeah. You're the man. Yeah. And everybody knows you. Everybody's related to you. What'd you say? Yes. 300 babysitters and what else, What do you got? Uh, four, you dated everybody's mom? Yeah. <laughs> everybody's mom. They go, yeah, I dated my mom. Or, oh, okay. I've done everything. <laughs> you've done everything. But I mean, but, but was that... Yeah, or they beat you up. A, everybody yeah. beat you up, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, I got beat up or I beat somebody up because... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, that's a really good question. It is. And this is for all the young up-and-coming athletes in, in every sport. Um, you know, I think I think another thing that there should be this day and age, like I'm not trying to be soft. You know, you got a lot of old-timers that go, just quit, just treat them like like athletes. And, and these kids got to learn how to toughen up and get balls. But unfortunately, time is changing. You know, everything's changing. And, and you have to treat it differently. And... I think that having some um, consulting people with some of these athletes um, is a big part of it, you know, to let them know some of the things that are out there, you know, and, and what to stay away from, what to stray away from. And, uh, you know, that's a, that is a big part of it. So, I mean, when you, when you speak of that, did you have any mentors at that time that were trying to put their arm around you like, Hey Kelly, uh, you know, you, you you need to stay low key. You know, you don't need to be going to these uh, these big functions or whatever. Yeah, it may be, no. You know? And so going back on that, I had people. Um, you know, they always tell you like, "Hey, well, it was right before the Taylor fight." You know, I, I'm probably right after either the Zartucci or the Edison Miranda fight. You people will come up and tell you like, "Hey, when you do this, it's going to change." You know, and, and it's going to be like this. And of course, like up here, you know, you know, you understand that, and you can kind of slowly start seeing how everything's changing at that point but you never fully prepared for it it's, it's hands-on training you know yeah. what i mean so it, it is it's overnight blink of an eye your whole life has changed you know um i'll tell you something funny about how how it works the miranda fight or right before the taylor fight hbo did the countdown and they went to the bar because i like throwing darts and everybody in there was like, oh, yeah, Kelly's just like one of us. You don't think he's better. He comes here and throws darts and has a beer. <laughs> Two months later, I win the world title. It's, what the fuck is Pavlik doing here? You know, he, he shouldn't be here. He's a drunk, you know. And that that's how it, how it really happens, you know. Um, it's sad, but these young kids have to realize that and they do need to form people around them. You're never going to get rid of the leeches. And the, and the uh, clingers, you're you're not going to get rid of them. You know, it's always going to be there. And I had a handful of them. If I could write a book, there'd be a lot of people that was involved with me that would be like, "Oh shit!" You know, I hope you don't write that book. You know, because it'll destroy <laughs> some lives. But but you're going to have that, and there's really no way because you can't you can't put the kid in a bubble. When a kid, ha the, the young fighter athlete, has to realize, you know, like I said before, hands on training and learn. But I think he does. They do need a, a good amount of people around him, somebody that's trustworthy, and you could actually, unfortunately, go out and hire people to do that for you because the better that kid does, the better they do. Absolutely. So, and that's the way it works. And it's kind of need like a filtering system. Or they some do, sorts. and I, I'm a big part. I mean, I'm a firm believer in that too. I think that someday, maybe through my charitable organization or something like that where we could either do classes for these kids, uh, or I keep saying kids, these young athletes, and, you know, show them what they need to do. Yeah, and, and I think right now kind of just, you know, one thing about you, and I know what we're talking about, you know, your career. You didn't, in my opinion, you know, you had some hard fights, but you would never, you know, you only have two losses in you know, yeah. your record. It's not like you were, like, ever brutally knocked out, you know. Uh, so at what point did you realize, like, you know, I just... What what really was that deciding factor to be like? I I don't I don't want to do this anymore. Some every, everybody's different, you know. Um, some guys will fight till they're fifty five. Some will fight till they're forty eight. And some guys will fight. And I can name a handful of world champions that got out of the sport young. When I won the world title, I was more so counting down to to retirement. You know, like the big fights. I was fi business wise, financially planning my exit you know, after the Taylor fight. And there was some, I mean, it should happen like in any career, you know, I had staff infection with Paul Williams and for a while, everybody was saying I was ducking Paul Williams, but yet I ducked the welterweight coming up to middleweight, but yet I jumped up two weight classes to fight Hopkins, yeah. you know, <clears throat> but um, the Hopkins fight was the bigger fight out there. And we had to take that because of the Paul Williams incident. The first time that the negotiations fell through 
So um, with that being said, you know, like there was, there was really nothing out there. And so as that, that went on, I took those fights, but then after those fights, yeah, I lost to Sergio Martinez and it was one of the fights where I should never have been at middleweight no more, but it was just too hard. Not making no excuses. It, it was just that way. And after Martinez, there were some incidents at home in a training camp at home, and it was really kind of pulling me even uh, further away and wanting to retire. And then Top Rank came over, and they, we had a big meeting in New York, and Top Ranks kind of gave me an ultimatum. And they were like, listen, you're going to go to California and train with Robert Garcia. Now, mind you, throughout from 2000 when I turned pro to 2011, Top Rank five times wanted me away from Jack. They actually sent me with Pat Barry to train, and I, I bitched and moaned until Jack came out there. So I was loyal, loyal as hell. Um, then when I saw so 2012 came in, and I listened, and, and I, I left you know home and went to train in California, and it was fantastic. Training with Robert Garcia, you know, you you, you learn because and taking nothing away from Jack, but when you're with somebody so long, there's only so much, yeah. and then you get with a guy like Robert Garcia who. See, has different style fighters, and he's all the way across country. Um, it, it was a neat experience, you know, because you're there and you're you're more open minded to to learning. And uh, it was cool; it was great. And I was like, okay, so my first fight with Robert Garcia, we fought a kid by the name of Aaron Jaco. Nobody knows. Um, and then we fought Scott Sigmund, who's a cool dude. I'm friends with him now on social media, but. Scott Sigmund was a kid that's almost a 500 fighter from Virginia. Then I fought Roel Rosinski. So by that point, I'm up, I'm away from home. Um, usually when you up and leave home and train to go to a training camp is when you're a prospect that's hungry and you want to make the money and get a title. Usually you don't see a person who's made a lot of money and had three world titles towards the end of their career up and leave home. You know what I mean? So I did it, though, and, and I was frustrated. I, I was really debating, and then that's when the Andre Ward fight was brought to the front, and we were negotiating that. And unfortunately, Andre Ward got that shoulder injury where he had to have the surgery, and he was out for a period of time. There was no other meaningful fights out there because the Super 6 was still going on, and that's when it was just time, like, I, I wanted to call it quits. You just didn't find a, you didn't want to like force a fight at no. that point. And listen, and I know this too, because one of the main reasons for always wanting to retire was to, especially when I had my daughter, was to protect my health, you know, for long term. Because even now, we don't know what can happen 10 years down the road. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And that was the big thing. Like um, when that fight was done, I, I just didn't have it. And in boxing, if you're not here, uh, it's a horrible hobby to have if you ain't. Got yeah, if you're not here. all the way in, it's dangerous. Yeah, you, know? you don't you don't play boxing, you know. You yeah, you don't. You know, so it's like um, I think with that being said, was um, did you ever get to a point where you just resented boxing? Though, like you're like, man, you know, like or even the two losses on your record. You know, you look, you know, we're talking about, you know, you shouldn't have been that middleweight against Sergio Martinez, but you were, you were, uh, and you look back like, man, I, I probably shouldn't have lost that fight, or I should never have took that fight. Yeah, you? you know, I always think about like, what if I would have just came in a pound and a half over. Yeah. And so what are they going to do? Strip me of the belts. They would have fined me a hefty, you know, price on that. But it was my last fight at middleweight anyways. Yeah. So take strip me of it, you know, and now I go out with a win. Um, and I, I stay undefeated in the middleweight division. We could have done that. And I would have probably took a lot of heat for that, becoming in a pound and a half over. Um, there was a lot of things. And I never throughout my career harped on them because even now, if I really – told the truth on those two fights. The only thing it's going to do is, is set everybody up to tear oh, me down. Oh, he's making them excuses, yeah. right? So what do I got to gain from it now, you know, talking about it 12 years after, or nine years after retiring, eight years after retiring. Yeah, I got nothing to gain from it. So I kind of just let it go. I, and I always say I lost to two um, all-time greats. Yeah, for in, sure. And Bernard Hopkins and, and uh, Sergio Martinez. And I beat good fighters, world champions, and I beat a guy twice who beat one of the greatest of all time twice. Controversial or hey, not. Hey, man, and you created one of the, you know, one of the greatest memories, you know, in HBO boxing history oh, for me, you know, yeah. and for a lot of people, you know, that that fight against Jermaine, you know, I mean, it was a good fight. It was a, yeah. it was a great middleweight fight. And, it was. 
And it, you know, so yeah, you definitely accomplished a lot. I'm just saying, like, in terms of like, did you ever resent the sport after you left? Because, no, because it gave you so much, but it also took so much. And you know, just kind of hearing you, like, it's like, was health or legacy the more important of the two for you? Oh, absolutely. And even to this day, I kind of sit back and, and go, you know, maybe I should have retired a year earlier. You know what I mean? I, I'm not lying. Um, as you get older and you mature and you you start seeing things differently. It's a dangerous sport. And we've seen this past year with everything. I mean, it's, yeah. it is. I, I see guys that are, I go to International Boxing Hall of Fame. I go to the Atlantic City Boxing Hall of Fame. I'm around it. I go to fights now. We have podcasts. Uh, me and James have this podcast where we cover fights. And I see the guys who are still young during their late 40s, mid 50s, some even early 60s. And you can start seeing the effects of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, for me, I, I was I was very content on it. And again, as I'm saying, it's not a bragging thing, but I was very fortunate to have the right people behind me, where I could stay retired and do the things that I want to do, you know. And that that's very important because it really sucks to go into the sport of boxing, as brutal as it is, and come away with nothing. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Well, you know, and I think on that topic, I want to ask you guys about. Uh, the fight with Deontay Wilder and uh, Tyson Fury, we talk about, you know, punishment. We talk about not being, a, not playing, you know, boxing. Mm -hmm. Do you guys feel that stoppage was premature? Do you think it was the right thing to do for the trainer? Because, I mean, we were seeing all the excuses flying, but. I, I think Mark really did the right thing. Uh, I think so. I think that, I think by all means, you can stop that fight maybe around earlier. Yep. I think it was stopped in the right spot, though. I mean. What about you, Kelly? Yeah, I agree with uh, James on that. I mean, it's hard with, in a situation like that. There's a lot of fights I see continue where I go, there's no chance in hell of this kid winning the fight. Why are you letting it go? Just stop it. You know, the kid don't have power or nothing like that. I know I can understand the predicament with this fight that Wilder hits so damn hard that anything can happen at any time. Mm -hmm. I understand that. But the guy also, I mean, he had a bad air drum, which you can obviously see his equilibrium's off. That's dangerous. Um, you know, he was fatigued. I, I definitely, I mean, he was bleeding for almost from every orifice in his face, like stop yeah. the fight. So I think they should have. I mean, and, and what was your overall takeaway from the fight? Do you, I mean, do you really think that there should be another fight? And if not, it, or if so, whatever the case may be, I mean, what's the fight to be made? Is it Joshua and Fury? I mean, I think that's the fight to be made. I, I, I don't know. I, I I called a dark horse the other day. I thought, what about Usyk and Fury? That'd be great. Yeah. Um Usyk, I, and I do agree with that a little bit, but I think Usyk still needs, because it's a no win for Fury. Fury goes in and beats up Usyk. Well, here's a guy that's new to the weight class coming up from cruiserweight, and he won't get the credit for it. I think that, yeah, Joshua is the next fight for uh, Tyson Fury, um, especially for him to to be listed up there with the heavyweights, you know. I think, in my opinion, you could mention him with the all-time greats. If he goes in, and beats Anthony Joshua. And it's blockbuster. It's big business. You know, you put that in Wembley, it's selling 100,000 tickets. You yeah. know? But I think a third fight with uh, Wilder. Personally, in my opinion, he he won the first fight. Um, Absolutely. He he won, you know, obviously this one, he beat him up. He fought a great strategy. Um, will it work again against even a guy like Wilder who's not that talented as a boxer? Probably not, you know, because yeah. you get two months to break down what happened in that fight. I don't think the bum rushing would work again. But, um, you know, for, for me, I think Fury just needs to move on. And I don't think he needs to fight uh, Anthony Parker or uh, anybody like that. Yeah, like Dylan White. Yeah, let him fight the, the top guy, Joshua, yeah. like the heavyweights did in, in the 90s. So. I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of places for Wilder to go. I mean, we were talking about the other day. I said, look, you have Anthony, you have Andy Ruiz. And yeah. you somewhere to go. Why not yeah. Wilder and Andy Ruiz? And then that, that, why, not, why not Usek? If he's coming up, why not Wilder and Usek? Just somewhere. Dylan White. Are you guys on Twitter by any chance? We are. I, yeah, I mean, I'm not that good with the Twitter. My PR lady kind of yeah. most the show, <laughs> you know. I, I like to watch everybody roasting each other on Twitter, so I just... I still don't know how it I works. Mean, like, I, I see all these comments, but I don't see replies or oh, anything. It's, it's crazy. So boxing Twitter is like one of the most oh, like God. entertaining things in the world because it's like... <laughs> It's, everybody's opinion is so interesting. But anyways, the reason why I was wanting to know if you guys were on Twitter, because today an interesting topic came up, and I, and I really want to get you guys' perspective on this. This is so left field and so random. Uh, but um, there was a little three-way exchange with uh, 
Earl Spence, Kel Brook, and uh, Amir Khan, right? <laughs> interesting, uh, interesting group of guys there that were exchanging, but apparently it was stemming from uh, Earl Spence. He just got a, 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 a you know, a, a new shiny pendant. What were they exchanging? Medical information? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> like, you know, uh, Health insurance. Oh, oh fuck. <laughs> All three uh, of them been some kind of train wreck lately, you know. Well, anyways, the, the, so it, it, the pendant it, apparently is a silhouette of of his knockdown against uh, Earl Spence's knockdown against Kell Brook. So they went back and forth, and that led for Earl Spence to call out Kell Brook's sexuality. Oh, and then Amir Khan no- chimes in, you know. And did, so, didn't he make a pick? Didn't he have a video on online? Yeah, that's yeah, what I was. I would have, I would have, I would have shied away from that whole conversation. Well, and, and apparently Kell Brook brought it up. But the reason why I mentioned that is not to not Amir to- Khan should borrow um, Kell Brook's. I can put it in his chin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right, so, I'm so, joking. I was totally. That, see, you rub off, man. No, but you, you know what been really funny? Is if uh, Kell Brook would have had a, a pennant of the Ferrari flipping. Oh, God. Damn. That would have been great. Well, here's the thing, though. Here, here's the only way I could justify this one. They they were on Twitter just running and, and causing a drama show. So, right? Yeah, I mean, that's all it was. Yeah. But the reason why I was asking was not to talk about Kell Brook's sexuality or whether or no, not he's no. gay or not. The question is, can there ever be a, a pro boxer that's openly gay? There is. Is there? Oh, yeah, there is. Yeah, there is. Okay. Well, there's two of them, but do you remember the one? What You sparred with them. What's the ki- what, what's, remember the one that did porn and woke up at the train tracks? With why you got to mention that, though? He sparred with you, right? Yusef Mack. You, you know his name, too. <laughs> And then there was that Puerto Rican kid. What was the Puerto Rican kid? Oh, the Puerto Rican kid. I remember. Yeah, he, he came out. Yeah, that's but the, I've never seen him fight really again, so. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what, I'm, that's yeah. what I mean. Like, someone that's like a, a, a box office attraction. I, I think so. It I could mean, be. I, it's 2020. I think things, things are changing. I, I, yeah. I, yeah, I believe so, too. I mean, I'm being honest with you. I don't see an issue with it. I don't. I really don't. Um Apparently, Earl Spence and Amir Khan were, were cracking jokes about it. So yeah. somebody has an issue. I mean, that's like the go-to thing to go to with Kel Brook right yeah. now. But, right? You know. I mean, you know what? You'd, you'd be surprised how many fighters. I mean, I can tell you off air how many fighters are. But, hmm. but you know, you, they just don't hear about it. But, yeah, it's, it's prevalent in boxing. It's yeah. like any sport. Are you ever going to fight again? I mean, I know that's a dumbass question, but I have to ask it just for the viewers. Do you ever want to fight again? Nah. What would it take for you to come out of retirement and knock out uh, Chavez Jr.? <laughs> 25 mil. Oh, you've been you've been called out multiple times. But yeah. He, Andre Ward. Andre Ward asked you if you'd come out of retirement. Yeah, but Andre, yeah, uh, Andre, though, Andre's a different level. He's such a businessman. And, <laughs> and I mean, what a career he's had, too. You know, Can we tell the story? Because it was a great story. Best story absolutely, in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. We were at a uh, Royal Lomachenko and uh, what fight was that? Lomachenko and uh, Pedrosa, right? Yeah, Lomachenko and Pedrosa. I I see Andre Ward walking. Andre Ward walks right at Kelly and goes, "Hey Kelly, um, did you consider coming back for ten million? Kelly said, "I don't see why you wouldn't." Mm-hmm. That was about it. That was a conversation. Yeah. I was like, "Oh shit." <laughs> I think he was testing the field. The that was that was about two years ago. Then you had uh, Cunningham call you out and want to do a fight in Pittsburgh. But Steve Cunningham. That came from uh, the Joe Rogan show. That was disrespectful. Yeah, that was. And I like Steve Cunningham. I, I, I do. And uh, he, we were always cool. He's close to my hometown and everything <laughs> else. And uh, yeah, I did that. The Joe Rogan thing kind of was set up for me to do that. It was a, the platform was there. <laughs> and, and at the time I did, you know, I had the, the itch to do it. Um, to, I was to think about coming back. You know, I was never serious about they it. They started throwing names like Usek at you. So yeah. Right off the bat. <laughs> so all these names were getting dropped. And, it, and it, the media buzz, I'm sure you remember, like the media buzz, like was just crazy. We got in a car and I had uh, writers from all over the country and I had Australia, the UK, <laughs> uh, you know, about this. Cause when I said it, I go, I, I talked to Mark LaMica, who was a music manager and I go, um, what do you think about it? He's like, do it. He goes, well, what's it going to hurt? And I was like, well, nobody's going to give a shit anyways. I've been retired for seven years. I'm going to be 37 years old. You know, who gives a shit if I made a comeback? And I really didn't think it was going to like take off like that and shit. It, it people did. still care about you, man. I, yeah. I, I don't think you're giving yourself enough credit. There, I, I know, but I was just looking at because I know I would if I somebody came back after seven years retired at 37, I'd be like, God, ah, why do I want to watch that? But the whole thing about it, there was so, such a, a big buzz on it, and then the next thing I know, I think it was like two weeks later, I'm getting called out by Steve Cunningham, who previously <laughs> who's lost eight, 
who previously mentioned you know about making a comeback and nobody nobody cared you know what i mean and i think that was like what really got him he's like so his next thought was well if i call out kelly pavlik who's getting all this buzz and i and it kind of it, it surprised me i don't think it's that big of a you remember asshole you, move because you know it is a business and, and if cunningham wants to fight one more time he probably thinks a fairly good name especially right now with all the media attention um after the rogan show and he's a middleweight coming up he ain't fought in seven years let me fight him well, see, and, and and that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to make the Chavez Jr. fight. Imagine the the, the party animal storyline with that one. Wow, you know, see two of the two of yeah. the most synonymous with the party animal. Hey, yeah, can, can Kelly make the weight? And will Chavez make the weight? I mean, <laughs> but um, I you know what? Me and Chavez would have no problem meeting. I catch weight. <laughs> <laughs> you both, both eating Fruit Loops in your underwear. Yeah. But um, no. When, do you remember when Cunningham said that? And I said, Why do you want to make that fight, Steve? I said, Are you the USS unemployed? Um. <laughs> He got mad, man. <laughs> but again, on that, you know, Steve's before that, Steve was always like super cool. And um, I got respect for him. Like, I could see his, his point for wanting to do it. There's, I really could. Isn't there better ways to do that? Yeah, like, he, he at first he wasn't he wasn't like harsh or anything. I mean, he was if you really go back and think about it, he's like, let's, let's make it happen. You know, let's do it yeah. for the fans. And I, he did. Well, I mean, I think to piggyback on all of that, you know, we talk about, you know, the, this day and age and how much things have changed and how much social media has become the ally of the fighters. Because back in the day, you know, certain fighters wouldn't be able to get TV exposure, wouldn't get TV time. And it's like now you have fighters that are being able to, like, you know, create their own real on they Instagram. Their, they can set their own cost. And they yeah. can set their own value. And you're seeing fighters. And right you got now. the Lomachenko effect where everybody's wanting to jump too fast you yeah know, you, not everybody's Lomachenko you know and, and I, I think right now we're, we're boxing's in a really you know I think it with social media the where it's at I think it, it has potential to be even more popularized in, in terms of the modern culture well, right? did, did Ryan Garcia sign the highest prospect contract ever because of social media, he's what, 1. 1. 1.3 million. Well, he has like I thought he had three more. or four on Instagram. Yeah, he Instagram, like a, crazy yeah, he, amount man. of numbers. But then he opened the, he actually opened up for Virgil to sign a better contract too, because now they're always trying, they're, they're all, they're forcing promoters to put pay money for them now. Mm. For sure. And ain't that funny too? You know, the 2000 was like the last, my amateur class coming out. They, they all got the big signing bonuses, and DeBella put that up, and they all flopped. And then I think 2004 got screwed because of that. They weren't given no signing bonuses or anything coming out. And then now you turn back around, you look at they that box, the, and now they got the big social media bonuses going yeah. out right now. You know, uh, yeah. we, we, you mentioned Virgil. Uh, you you spent a lot of time at the oh, Garcia yeah. gym. You know, uh, you know he he was on their show. You saw the interview, oh, which yeah. is how you're, you're fantastic here. interview. Too. Thank yeah. you, man. Thank you, thank you. I'm I'm a big a big uh, fan of Virgil, big oh. supporter of Virgil. Oh, absolutely. Your thoughts on Virgil Ortiz Jr. Um. The kid's an animal. First of all, and I'm not just saying this. Um, him and his dad, what they're doing is great. Such a well-mannered kid. Um, but I'm in the habit of calling people kids. But to me, you know, yeah, he's, no, he's a good amount younger. We, we, we um, get it. We get it. I'm, I'm approaching that 40 mark, so I, I don't know why I'm <laughs> they're, doing They're kids that. to you. Yeah. <laughs> so, but he is. He, he's he's um, well-mannered, uh, just nice, uh, kind. But he's also a killer on the flip side of that. And when he gets into the ring, you know, he's he's a no bullshit guy. He's not going to, a lot of people try to market themselves as like Floyd did to get people to hear them and, and they open their mouth. And I think it's cool because you need some of that in boxing, but I don't think we need all of that in boxing. And it's not WWE. So the ha it's a fresh breath of air to listen to Virgil Ortiz talk and, and get ready for a fight because all the quiet ones if you ever noticed in boxing, yeah. were the ones that went in and just whipped straight ass. Yeah. Um, and Virgil's one of them guys. And I think that comes from his dad too, um, how his dad has worked with him. And uh, as far as his fighting ability, he he really climbed up. I mean, when he first turned pro, he had good hand speed, but he was just a, a devastating puncher. And you could see that that's what he was relying on. And then he just made that, which is a big thing in boxing, where he could slowly make that, tra or quickly make that transition through the early part of his career, where now he's just taken everything, the whole package. He's boxing. He's um, taking some snap off the punches and and setting up for the big punches, um, his defense. And he's, and he's doing that against good, good opposition. opposition. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, I think all around, Virgil's somebody definitely. Would you say he's your favorite young fighter? Absolutely. 
One hundred percent, absolutely. Yeah. And another one who's making a climb, not to the level of Virgil Ortiz, but Ryan Garcia. And I we said that what from the beginning. Tiafimo Lopez. Oh, I think, well, Tiafimo's I, I think Tiafimo, but he's a world champion. Yeah, now. he's he's at that level now. You know, um, and I think Virgil Ortiz is is right there too. I think you could actually well, just put Virgil Ortiz. We talked about that before in the yeah. show. We said that Tiafimo and Virgil are neck and neck. Yeah, and then Vir else Virgil's is like right not even a prospect. He's a contender. Yeah. Well, and then yeah. well, we had Shakur yeah. right there, and then. You have that other class of fighter. You have Conlon, mm -hmm. who hasn't pr really produced as much as the rest of them. Yeah, and you got a guy like Ryan Garcia, and I said that. Ryan Garcia, everybody mature is different in sport, um, mm -hmm. and they do. It, Ryan Garcia, you could just see in his, his the way he um, carries himself and his personality, that that's, that's a fighter, a young fighter that's really going to have to Take his, you know, Golden, Golden Boy is going to have to market him kind of like how Bob Barham did with De La Hoya. The only thing was De La Hoya could fight his ass off when he came out of the amateurs. Yeah. Um, Ryan Garcia, I think he has the tools and the skills, but I think he still needs, they need to slow him down a little bit more and keep marketing him the way they are. And then he could be a guy who, who they could put in there to win a world title. There's a lot of opinion. there's a lot of glaring flaws with Ryan Garcia that a lot of people see. The chin yeah. high up in the air, the chin straight up in the air, standing straight up, um, kind of just admiring his work. And you know, we know that you're eventually you're gonna get caught doing yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just about you know, establishing a good progression chart and not rushing it. But when no. you have you know, and I think whenever you have someone like him at that age with that, you know, his social media presence yeah. and the people around him, they're like, oh, you're ready right now. It's I will, like, I will say, fighter. though, he's, I will say though, though. he's gotten better and better. Yeah. The, the fight between him and Tank's a lot closer now than it was last year. But that's Absolutely. what I'm saying, because they and moving him the way they were, you know, the way they are is what's going to help him. You know, I want to ask you something that I've always, you know, just wanted to have a, a, a full fledged conversation about. I was talking to Mikey about this, you know, so I interviewed Mikey Garcia a few days ago in preparation for the Jesse Vargas fight. And when me and him were uh, having our conversation, um, I was telling him, I was like, hey, man, you know, you know, Earl Spence is a hometown guy. We support Earl Spence. Don't get me wrong. Um, but, you know, whenever they fought at AT&T yeah, Stadium, we, yeah. we, you know, obviously the promoters want to have the narrative that Spence was the draw because he was a hometown boy. You go to that that fight in Mikey was 75% oh, yeah. of that audience, you know, we were, we were there that night. And we, mm -hmm. You know, same thing at the press conference. I'm like, Hey, did you feel like you didn't get your just due in terms of you being the draw? So this then, you know, initiated the conversation. I didn't really get an opportunity to finish it, which was Sergio Moore, who's a good friend of ours. You know, yeah. uh, me and him had this conversation. Um, I asked him, I said, you know, the Hispanic fa fight fan base, you know, the, where the, you know, a lot of ways we, we account for so much of the pay-per-view buys mm -hmm. and, you know, I, it, it it's not to take anything away from Spence again, but it's like we go back to like Floyd's career, for example, right? Where Floyd, you know, he, you know, he fought and, you know, he, he, he throws those pay-per-view numbers around. But let's be real. Who, who did he sell over a mill with that wasn't a Hispanic fighter with the exception of obviously the the sideshow of him versus Conor McGregor? Oscar, Mike Donna. The only, the only person that he went over a mill with that wasn't, you know, Hispanic was Shane Mosley, right? Yeah. But the the you know he obviously Pacquiao but Pacquiao to me was adopted by the Mexican fight fans because of all his great fights with Mexican fighters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you go down the list with all the Hispanic fighters. Cotto, Marquez, his dancing partners were always Hispanic that he went over a mill with. Madonna was kind of on the edge. Guerrero was on the edge. But you look at a fight with him and Berto, four hundred thousand pay per view buys. I just kind of want to ask you guys, just from you obviously just from observing the sport, how important that 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 is in terms of like the hispanic fight fans and just in general in my perspective on the floyd theory where mm -hmm. it's like he's getting all the credits for all the pay-per-view buys you know like i was telling mike i don't feel like you got the credit for for what you brought in terms of the draw and he's like hey you know i don't care my dollar check cash though there's it? still there's still uh mikey's mike is a very humble guy and uh even with this fight with jesse vargas because jesse vargas has a big following and and, and a backing also and they were kind of, I seen an interview where Mikey and, and Robert were going, well, Jesse's got a lot of fans here for this fight. And he probably does. Yeah. You know, don't get me wrong. Um, so Mikey's like that. But he, obviously, I, I think Mikey was the John S. Spence fight. I, I really think Texas is a second city. I mean, state, no, absolutely. State Mikey. He's putting mm. all these fights in Irving right yeah. now. I think this is yeah. like maybe his fourth or fifth fight that he's putting they in. They love him in San Antonio. Yeah, Texas. Yeah, Texas is a, a huge fight yeah. market, you know. But continue what you're saying. But Spence, you know, and again too. I mean, it's kind of hard because Spence is from Dallas too, and they they had a nice amount, of, a good amount of people Absolutely. in that that stands mm -hmm. too, um, and Spence people. But um, we saw a lot of Mexican flags in there. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, oh my god, oh, yeah. it was rough getting out of there that night. You know, <laughs> Mikey. Yeah, I would say he's a big draw, especially in Texas, and he's going to be in California. And even with this fight, I think Mikey's still going to be 
They're going to sell it out. Yeah, oh, he's, he's going to be the bigger, bigger well, part of it. I think part of that, too, is Mikey's social media presence. I mean, El- Ellie Secback has done so much for Mikey's career, yeah. just constantly putting posting yeah. videos and never We're trying to get Ellie in here tonight. I was trying to get Ellie Why in here. Why did you tell me? I could, yeah, yeah, we, we got put in the hole. We're trying to let him know. Well, I hey, think he was with you guys earlier. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, Ellie hustles, him. man. He's he, a guy. He deserves um, all the credit he gets, or, or he should more, get more credit for what he does. I think he's done more for our show than anybody. Yeah. Starting out. Yeah. I mean, he's got people. He's got a lot of haters too. Oh my god! But Ellie, but he also has like what five hundred thousand YouTube subscribers yeah. or something. Exactly. Yeah. He's exactly. Like, so who cares? Yeah. I and then to- people like to get on her because you know this day and age, social media is a platform for people to feel relevant, and, <laughs> and it really is. <laughs> so like they could get on his show and comment and be like, "Ellie, you're an asshole. You know, you're stupid. You don't know what you're talking about." So obviously you're watching his show and you found that show. Well, you know, Ellie gave me the best advice for us. He said, whether they love you or hate you, they're still watching. Exactly. And for me, Absolutely. it's hard for me because I take everything to heart. Like Kelly, he don't care. Because whatever. Yeah. But I'm like, why did you say that about Kelly? I'll kill you. Because <laughs> I'm naturally protective over my friend, you know? Yeah. But Kelly's like, no, it's no big deal. Man, it's, if I got pissed off for everything that was said, I would. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? I want to go back to the I would pull my skin off. I want to go back to the early days, right? So what made you fall in love with the sport, right? And and what ultimately led for you to get in the sport? Okay. Um, I started off, I played baseball, football. I grew up in the inner city on the south side of Youngstown. And a Browns fan. Yes, yeah. yeah I know. Oh, and that's probably where I learned to fight. Um, <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not, to, not having a girl's name or nothing like that, you know, just probably being a Browns fan. But uh, Kelly with the eye. <laughs> yeah, but you know, my, I had two older brothers. Uh, I was the youngest. I had an older brother that's six years older than me. My brother Michael and my brother Ricky is four years older, and they were good athletes, and and they were involved. And then somehow, and my buddy Louis Alessio, who was like a brother, he lived right across the street, and uh, you know, in the city, you could spit on your buddy's house. You know, that's how close all the houses are. And um, they were going, and I would go down at his, my buddy Louis. His dad was a good amount older, and they had, you know, Louis at an old age. and But he used to fight back in the 30s, and he had the old gloves that we would get the cooking timers, you know, put them on two the minutes. Timer. <laughs> yeah, so I would box with my brothers, and then my brothers are still going to Southside Boxing Club. And I remember coming home, and I'd have – and this is where times are different from me growing up. I think I was, like, the end of that generation. i come home, and i have the blood on my lip and, like, all – red my face is flushed and, and i'm like trying to hide it i'm trying to get the oxygen in me i'm cleaning the blood off me so when i go home i don't get in trouble or if i couldn't get it off i had to come up with a good excuse about playing backyard football because if i would have told him i'm down there fighting my brothers and we're beating each other till we bleed so um i'll never forget it i mean after like a year of just constantly begging they took me to martial arts and that's when all the karate movies were big in the 80s the late 80s and Blood um, sport, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and karate kids and all that and i was running through the house doing flying kicks my dad's like fuck this we got to get him to karate um <laughs> karate's expensive it was boring um I, I just couldn't do it so he took me to the gym and i've the first person i met jack wasn't there that day and i got to meet harry roya who was the F- ibf lightweight champion from youngstown and at the same time around the same time as mancini and uh I, I was like, just, I went back after that and I trained and I liked it because it was fun. And then I sparred and I got my butt whipped pretty good. And um, I came home and the next day my dad was kind of happy about it because he thought I was done. You know, he thought I wasn't going to go back. And I went into the bedroom and I packed a bag and I came out and my dad goes, where are you going? I was like, I'm going to go kick that kid's ass today. And, and I went back and I sparred him like three days later and I, I put it on him that time. And I just... It's weird. You know, I tell people like boxers, you can't make a boxer. Like, so somewhere along the line, they're, they're born with that. And I just started when I was, you know, I, I didn't fight that much because I was still playing baseball and football. And maybe up to like 15 years old, I had about 20 fights total. And then about 15, 16 is when I really got serious and I was winning, you know, national titles. The Junior Olympic, I won two JO nationals. Then I went to the under 19 nationals and I won that. And I, and I turned pro from there. I mean, it just happened so fast. It was, yeah. it became, I, I quit football at 12 years old or 13. I quit baseball at 17 and um, focused on boxing. Even when I was playing baseball, I was I was talented enough to where I could still go and, and pick up on a sport without practicing. Other kids are in fall league, all this other shit. And, and I was boxing 
And uh, so, did you fall in love with it, knowing that you can kick somebody's ass? I, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, honestly, I'm not gonna lie yeah, to you. It just don't like, hurt. Like, yeah. Man, yeah, like if can't. I can't, if I can't do the fucking swan kick or or break his wrist, <laughs> I'm gonna beat the shit out with my knuckles. Yeah, you but know? see, you were lucky. I I grew up in Oxnard. Everybody boxed, so you're just one in a whole thing. You're just taking your chances there. Yeah. <laughs> so so Kelly Pavlik, the movie, right? If he if there was a movie on your your life. Hmm. And there was a biopic. Who would play you? And Vin, what would the name Vin of the movie be? Yeah, Vin Diesel. Uh, him or, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? I can't say his name, right? Jason, Jason Statham? Statham? Statham. Jason Statham? Yeah, Statham. What would the name of the movie be? The Ghost. The Ghost. Ah, I like that. Uh, so The Haunting. <laughs> Time and Tribulations of the Ghost. <laughs> I want that. You know what? I want that horror movie, like every horror movie. You know what, though? They need, to, they need to do it on the, on the, on the Spanish channel. El, El Fantasma. Fantasma. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Bone Thugs and Harmony. They've been good friends of yours. If you're a member of Bone Thugs and Harmony, what bone would you be? Broken bone? Nah, I'd be. Well, I'm white. I'd probably be Milk Bone. <laughs> He's white. <laughs> or Ghost Bone. Ghost Bone. <laughs> oh, man. You know what? Listen, I, I always uh, screw around. Um, that kid that you were talking to, James mentioned, Scotty Weaver. Uh, so they came to my gym. There's a song out there, and and half that video was filmed at my gym. And Kane and uh, Lazy Bone do it. It's a pretty sweet song, to be honest. Yeah. And uh, I'm in the video, and I went home, <laughs> and when I found it on YouTube, I go to my wife because I hung out with Foo Fighters, uh, Avenged Sevenfold, through the rock scene, metal. Yeah. You know, Dude, so you I, hung out with Steve Tyler. Steve oh yeah. Tyler. So I, I say like I'm 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 a rock star. You know, yeah. I, I grow, <laughs> really. I mean, but I have proof for that, and and I. I got a 40 foot RV that's not the size of a tour bus, but it's cool. So then I switched it over and um, with Bone, and I, I went home and I was like, "I'm officially in Bone." We just we just we just wrapped up a video shoot today. She's like, "What are you talking about?" I was like, "Give it a couple of days. The LP is dropping." And uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the, Are they for, your favorite rap group so, of all so time? For, I grew up on Bone, man. They yeah, were from yeah. Cleveland. They yeah, were an hour okay. away. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you had you know you had to. Uh, DMX was uh, another big one. Crucial Conflict when oh, I was coming shit. up was was big. <laughs> Going hard. Yeah. yeah. Did you tell? That's not your first rap album, though. You put one out yourself, right? You remember your rap album? Yeah, we on. can't talk about that though. <laughs> oh, man. Jesus. It's on YouTube. <laughs> The ghost. No, it's not. Yes, it is. You and Max Kellerman right next to each oh, other. Oh, shit. I remember the Max Kellerman rap video from 1994. Take it nowhere. I can't take this son of a bitch anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I started doing that. I, I tell her all the time now. And then, I, like, the next day I put on, um, I wait for, like, the first of the month, and I put that song on for her. And she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, man, it was my group. <laughs> yeah, we have fun. They're, they're cool guys, though. Kane, um. All them guys up there, you know, I, I, coming up in boxing, actually Ghost, a funny story, I got that nickname. Um, I fought in the Cleveland Amateurs, and I was like one of the only white kids. And But I, eventually, <laughs> over the period of time, even my rivals up there, we would go to nationals together, like uh, Henry White, they called him Poe. And we room together, and we became like best friends. I mean, two years before, we were enemies, and then we just became friends. So, But they all started calling me Ghost because I was a white kid. And then I took the video home after the one tournament. And at that time, I was really slick, you know, because it was before the maturity power kicked in. Yeah. And I was boxing the shit out of people. And I like, spin around them. And my brother was watching it. And this was the VHS days. And he goes, uh, man, he's like, you move like a ghost in there. So for two different reasons, I got called ghost. And nobody really had that nickname. So it was kind of like. Oh, I like this. You know, I'm going to keep it's a that. It's badass thing, man. We got to admit, yeah. that's one of the best thing names in the game, you know? Mm -hmm. so. And I did have it. And I Robert. talked with my buddy before, Robert Guerrero, and he even knows the fact that I came out with the ghost before him. Yeah, I remember that. So oh, b before we wrap up, I know that I wanted to ask you, you mentioned earlier, whenever you um, you, you first started boxing, you know, you, you got into the gym at a young age and you talked about the karate stuff and it was expensive. Correct me if I'm wrong. Are you not opening up uh, your own nonprofit organization, boxing uh, gym, right? Yes, so the, Kelly Public, the Kelly Pavlik Charitable Organization. I am putting an amateur show on April 25th um, in Youngstown, Ohio, uh, to raise as a fundraiser to raise money for this. Um, any kid under 18, no matter where you're from, is free. You don't have to pay. Um, we'll have programs set up. Just it's going to give structure to these young guys. 
and they're going to come in uh, grades got to be out of trouble um, they're going to you know learn hands-on skills and, and things like that so it's going to be neat I think it's going to really help out and plus overall it's going to help out boxing in the Youngstown area again it's going to rejuvenate it um, I'm not doing it to take away from any of the other gyms that that's in the area back in the, the day in the hot hot time of boxing in Youngstown when we had five four world champs around the same time you had a gym almost at every corner on every side of town east side north side west side south side and i think this here will be something that kind of kickstarts that again also and you mentioned uh you're gonna have people going out there and doing like classes and talking to the kids right? absolutely i got good friends with maurice claret oh, who, yeah, you know played he's a motivational speaker now doing uh great things um He's an unbelievable speaker. I would like to have him in maybe three times since he's in the area a lot mm. to come in and talk to them guys. And and uh, who else better can you have? You know, and there's other people out there, you know, with the connections I have, you know, to have people come in like that also. Speaking of your connections, and we go back to this Bone Thugs and Harmony thing, man. They're coming in town in a couple of weeks, man. So I need you to get them on the show, you know. And maybe you can do the whole Bone Thugs and Harmony thing. I bet, you know? I bet if she gave a sh- Kelly gave a shot, I bet we could do it. Get it on. Get on. Yeah, you know, and when you do that, let me know because I have to have a talk with him. Though. I don't feel like I'm getting my fair share cut yeah, on this. You don't got your medallion either, that bone medallion. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I did drop that video with them, and I'm not getting no kickbacks on that. <laughs> Was he on the song? Yeah, he was on the song. Uh-huh. Oh, so you were actually on the song. Yeah, yeah I'm doing. I'm in a video. I'm doing. A, they don't invite. They don't rap. invite me to nothing. <laughs> oh man. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, before we wrap up, man. Uh, we didn't even know we were doing it that night. Yeah, <laughs> before, sure before we wrap up, let's plug. <laughs> let's plug the podcast. Uh, um, you guys, go ahead, Kelly. You're the better at than I am. It's the I, the easiest way to get to it. I, I say is the punchline dot live, yeah. and that will take you into the YouTube, and that's our like um, landing page pretty much. And you can go in there and find all the uh, archive uh, shows that we did, and we've had some great guests. Uh, unfortunately, we've come to find out when we have guests on, and it could be we could pull Joe Lewis back up and put him <laughs> on a show, and we will lose listeners. Like the format that we set up with, where we answer the questions from everybody. They they get really pissed when we're not able to do that and they're not be able to be able to be heard. We had Terrence Crawford on there, and we've lost. Yeah, half man, our, I'm a big fan of Terrence Crawford, by the way. We've uh, lost half of our people having Terrence on there because people want to hear themselves talk. They don't care about yeah. what the fighter has to say. Wow. So real quick though, yeah. So punchline dot live, and then we're on Facebook too, which is big. You know, you could go to the punchline, um, the punchline with Kelly Pavlik and James Dominguez. Just don't click on my page. <laughs> Who's your favorite fighter of all time, by the way? Oh. I, I got I got a few more out. Of, I got to ask real quick, kids. Yeah, I, I got to say, um, Sugar Ray Leonard, um, I thought was amazing, amazing fighter. Uh, you can do everything, and that's why I have him slightly over Mayweather as greatest of all time, is because of what uh, Sugar Ray Leonard was able to do. Mm-hmm. Of course, we can't deny uh, Atoro Gotti with his style. I mean, Atoro Gotti. Every time he came to fight, you were on the edge of your seat because Must see TV, man. you never knew what was going to happen. Gotti didn't start fighting until he got dropped and was bleeding. Um, there was a handful. Paul Spadafora from Pittsburgh because I was a kid and, and came up watching him. Um, Harry Arroyo from Youngstown. Uh, Sugar Shane Mosley was always fun as a young kid. I remember watching his style. Oscar De La Hoya. So many. You know, I, would, I never really had a, like a hero or one person. You would never go in my bedroom and see a poster of De La Hoya hanging. I just always liked watching the sport, and I was a student of it at a young age. And I had just many people. I would kind of like, co- we talked about this. I would copy some of the styles and like tweak them a little bit and make them my style. And then eventually, I, I obviously came into my own. Is there anyone you wish you would have knocked out? Yeah, a lot of people. <laughs> Not in the ring either. But. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. In the ring, man. Yeah, no. Um, Number one person you would Yeah, I would have liked to have an opportunity at guys like like Carl Frotch. Um, Calzaghi, I would like to have fought. I think he's one of the most underrated fighters of all time. Sure. Man. Um, but, you know, no matter what would have happened, and I'm realistic. I mean, Joe Cal- Calzaghi could fight. But, uh, yeah, there was a handful of them out there. Uh, John Duddy. Um, a good kid. I like to fight in uh, Sergio Moore, and I know he really wanted uh, that fight. Man, we were talking about that recently. Yeah, yeah. and I, and I think Sergio is a, a cool dude. I, I really do. Now, um, we were talking about that with him at the um our, at the bar our bar right and uh, at the MGM. Yeah, lobby. I talked with uh, Sergio about that. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, and again, I don't know if Sergio likes me, but nah, he does. Yeah, but he I, does. I, I I think he's a cool guy and, and super nice. So, but that would have been a good fight. 
You know what I mean? Of course, he knows I would have won, but it, <laughs> it gave him the you know it gave him the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, hey man, you know the, the fighting gets done in the ring. But anyways, uh, man, we'll wrap up here, man. We've been going for how long? Have we been going for Mo? It's been going on for a while. We will probably stay here all night if we don't leave right now. Uh, we we could definitely go on part two soon. I uh, appreciate you, Kelly Pavlik, for coming. You guys are more than welcome to come anytime. When the video comes out, y'all make sure to share with other fans. Oh, of course. We're gonna do oh absolutely. We do. We'll Let us know if you can send it to us. We'll put it on our uh, punchline page. Yeah, we'll share with all three of our fans, right? Yeah. All three. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm sure you got one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Kelly, man, I was wanting to know, obviously, you, you, you've lived a rock, style, uh, a rock star lifestyle. I wouldn't go that far. I mean, I had fun. <laughs> you know, you got over, everybody over here and be like, "See, he's fucking crazy." He was living the council. He was living like <laughs> all right, man, I, know, star. I, I oversold it. All right, so you no, were, I, if I lived that way, I would I would have been one of the guys that went you know broke. <laughs> you're a diet quick. rock star. Like, okay, all right. So so we exaggerated. You said you're a rock star, but being around all these stars over the years, yeah, has there yeah. has there ever been a point in time where you got starstruck by anybody? Yeah, yeah, I ain't gonna lie to you. Who was it? Well, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a metal guy too. Like, I, I like the old school rap. I'm a big DMX and NWA and and uh, you know I said Bone and Crucial Con Wu Tang. Um, I like that type. Um, and then I was a, a metal guy too. You know, like a hard rock. You know, I couldn't listen to country. So, th- but there was one time the Buck Cherry. I, I don't know if you ever heard of that. I haven't group. heard of Buck Cherry, but I'll look yeah, it up. They, they sing that the, song. They had the stripper anthem song, right? Yeah, <laughs> like Crazy Bitch, but she felt so good. I want to talk. That song. You've been to a strip club. You they, know the song. They, uh, yeah, yeah they, they came out. They came and played, and I trained them. And they're awesome guys, man. Um, great group. And, and they wanted to box, but they were playing with the Venge Sevenfold, which is like one of my favorite groups. And I kept the entire time was like just trying to. Yeah, but what about Avenge? Am I going to get a chance to meet them? And, <laughs> you know, like tonight. And uh, when I met Avenge, it was um, it was cool. I was, I was starstruck. Um, there was hey, there were so many people that I met. You know, I got to go talk to the um, Ohio State Buckeyes the night before mm-hmm. the biggest rivalry in, in in college football. You know, Ohio State Michigan, mm-hmm. and uh, to be able to do that that ranks up there pretty high. You know, yeah. not too many people could say they get to do that. So there was a handful of times though with uh, certain. You know, guys, LeBron James was a pretty big one. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal was a big one. Shaquille O'Neal is the reason I watch basketball. He put, one of yeah. he, athletes. Tell him when he put his hand on your head, Kelly. Shaquille yeah, he put his hand. He kissed my head. <laughs> I got a big-ass dome, you know. And uh, he literally, with like one hand, was able to reach it around and touch his pinky tip. I'm going, now I'm 6'2". You know, you, you, at 6'2", especially 10 years ago, now kids are 14, 13 or 6'2", but I was like, I felt all right. You know, I'm like... <laughs> tall and, and then he just comes in and, and he's just a, a monster um very humbling <laughs> that this grown man could do that you know whenever you hear people say boxing is not mainstream or that boxing is dead because i'm sure we've all heard that at some point or another I, we, it's never going to be dead just to be clear but when you hear that what are your thoughts on that this horseshit we see 2.8 billion dollars 2018 i don't think it was yeah, dead at all it may, it's uh making a comeback big time um yeah, it's not UFC's out there. Listen, we know how boxing goes, and it's always been that way for 120 years now. <laughs> um, it's going to have its downs. It's going to have its. It's going to take his black and blue eyes. Um, but boxing is always going to be boxing. It's going to be one of the top sports, and it ain't going nowhere. So you know, and you just you keep getting guys. I think this last fight with because everything does kind of start with the heavyweight division. Mm-hmm. It's great when you can get that crossover fighter that's in the lower weight classes. That's really good for boxing, but. It still happens. It starts with the heavyweights, and that fight with Wilder and Fury was big. And yeah, I think that it felt big too. You know, yeah. that I felt like man. You know, I think I tweeted out heavyweight boxing is back because even though you've had those fights, it just felt electric. It gave you that vibe, like yo, mm-hmm. this is a big fight. You see all the stars there and shit. You know yep, what I mean? Exactly. Like, you know, oh shit, he's there, he's there. So you know, I, I, get, so, you I know, get that feeling when Canelo fights though. I get excited. When oh he yeah, fights I do. Too. Whenever Canelo fights someone meaningful, you know, not yeah. to take anything away from his opponents, but I'm not getting excited. To, you know, I think the first deal on the zone whenever he fought. I can't uh, remember his that, name. Yeah. yeah, and I think you know, Flo- you did Rocky have Floyd Fielding. Mayweather. But right, I think right. Floyd Mayweather was so big that he was almost not considered. I think he was too crossover mainstream, where it didn't really help the sport that much because. How big Mayweather I, was. I think boxing's in a better position than it's been in 20 years. I mean, every mm. weight class is a star in it. I mean, they might not be the draw, but, but going on starstruck. Look at you got anyway, Lomachenko. When I fought, I had guys, you know, the second Taylor rematch, Guy Fieri, who ended up coming over to my house before. Mm-hmm. Guy Fieri with Food Network. Um, 
uh, Vince Vaughn. You know Vince what I mean? Vaughn, yeah. yeah, Vince Vaughn was there. Uh, yeah, you get starstruck with that. But boxing brings out, and just going back to it, boxing brings out the big time stars like that and the celebrities because of, you know, it's always been that way. Who's dude. the most random celebrity like that you would say that was like, man, I'm a fan of yours, Kelly, like that they're, they, they like the way you fight? I'd probably say Vince Vaughn was one of them. Yeah, that's, Steven Tyler. That's, yeah, Steven Tyler. Steven There's so Tyler. many, Oh, that's man. a special one. You know, Steven yeah. Tyler? The guitarist for uh, Foo Fighters, who are probably one of the hottest rock groups, you know, Corn. of all Corn. Yeah, crossover. Corn um, you were, man, that, you were that guy, man. They gave him a guitar. Yeah. I've been trying to get that guitar off him for about, what, seven years now? <laughs> Ain't gonna happen, man. You know what? I'm, I'm gonna tell the story because it's great. He he gave the, he, he donated the, the trunks from uh, Bernard Hopkins and I don't know why, but I was like, you know, since you're giving trunks away that you've lost it, can I have the Sergio trunks? It's not going <laughs> to. Kelly, he ain't going to give them to me. <laughs> Listen, I don't know. I mean, I, the Hopkins fight, that's a fight that I kind of want. I, I've had, I've gotten trunks. You know, I got my great ones, the world title <laughs> trunks and all that. You know, and I, I've had my perks to God, there's so many. What the fuck do I want the Hopkins one? And I got my ass whooped in that fight. <laughs> Sergio Martinez, so that's what I want. But no, you know what? Sergio was more competitive, believe it or not. <laughs> you go back and watch that fight. I was up after nine rounds on a scorecard. To be fair, you gave me the um I have the the top from uh from um the, the second rematch of uh Jermaine Taylor. I yeah, have you that, do. I have the uh, top. corner jacket. I got the corner jacket from that yeah. fight. What's your thoughts on uh pro boxers fighting MMA fighters? Let it happen. Um I think MMA fans need to realize <laughs> just because your guy um <laughs> fights and, and all that that he's not going to win in the boxing ring it's not going to happen he's not going to beat a pro and if conor mcgregor fought a, a guy his size like canelo? canelo i understand everybody will say well maybe we'll beat the shit out of canelo but styles make fights you put a big guy in there like canelo against conor it's even worse and but i, I do feel this way anymore if you're the boxer and you're going to take that fight against the guy in your ring then go to balls and go over to the octagon too. Absolutely. You know, if it's going to be that way, I, I, I truly do. It's not fair. Um, MMA fans believe that their guys are going to win even in the boxing ring. That's where I think a lot of boxing fans are, are not as um, hard headed. Yeah, we, yeah. We, I don't know that. I'm, I've never been a fan of it, so I'm just MMA? curious. No, M no MMA fighters fighting oh, in the yeah. pro boxing ring. I, just I mean, do. I think it's only fair. To, because they're saying Terrence Crawford, you know, Bob Aaron's running out of options with him. Oh, yeah. we're going to set up to the UFC. Terrence Crawford is a legit fighter, though. I mean, he's a, he was a wrestler. Yeah. yeah. He's, he works for jiu-jitsu. I mean, why not? Like, just like, I think Lomachenko. Lomachenko, too, could do it. Can do a good job. That's interesting. I don't want to see it. No. no. At all. Like, I don't want to see it. And that's why I asked, like, you know, what's your thoughts on that? And, yeah. you know, uh, so prime yeah. Kelly Pavlik versus Canelo Alvarez, how does that play out? I think I'd be Canelo. Canelo is a great fighter, but he's not active. He fades. And my point was, my strong point was my chin, my power, and then the punch output. Not too many people will average that. What does the future hold for you, man? Do you do you want to be a trainer? Do you want to be? Uh, do you want to have a promotion company? Do you want to be a commentator? What, what's uh, what's what's in the future for you, Kelly? Okay, well, right now I have the charitable organization. I got the fitness gym, which is cool, and it takes care of itself. Having fun with the podcast uh, to be able to do things like this here with you great guys and having fun. Um, we actually have uh, something really big going right now. Now I don't want to talk about it because I don't want to you know jinx it, and it's so close to almost being done. But it'll be big, and I'll keep you posted on it. Awesome. Uh, it's going to be nationwide throughout the country, um, and it's going to help the youth. You know, um, fifth grade through twelfth grade. Uh, so we're in the works with that, and it's it's pretty cool. Then it could be something that's really big. Um, and also now I'm working on training fighters. I would like to get into the commentating field. Um, I've seen some guys on there that are doing it, and I go, and I think guys like Sergio Moore, Good. Paul Malinaji, I think those guys are great for commentating. They actually give you something, and, and the average fan can listen to the casual, yeah, yeah and, and learn. From it, and there's some guys that do it. I'm going. How do they get on here? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, favorite current fighter? Any yeah. weight class? Yeah, I, but you know, you, you know, yeah, you have to understand. I got a lot of buddies. I, I like watching <laughs> Mikey Garcia. I think he's a great fighter. Um, you say it with your brain, not your heart. No, but so you know what? I, I spoke to Mikey real quick. I spoke Virgil about, Ortiz. Absolutely Virgil. I was speaking to Mikey. Mikey by the way, not to cut you off, but I'm, yeah. I told Mikey that 
I think he'd make a great commentator. No, he would. He's very he he's very intelligent. Mm -hmm. He knows how to break it down, yeah. break it down, break it down. But I think uh You know, he's a guy though that doesn't like Kelly, he's a guy that doesn't keep uh memorabilia in his house. He doesn't watch a lot of boxing unless he has to. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Crawford overall, I mean, if you're going on like package, like who got it, Crawford is a sharp dog. Lomachenko a right now is is sick. I'm a big NUA fan. Yeah, NUA um I'm a big fan because he's a hometown guy, but uh, Sean Porter, he oh, could yeah. fight. And no matter who you put in, he's got a style that everybody could go, oh, this person would beat his ass. Nobody does, though. Anytime <laughs> yeah. you go fight Sean Porter, you got to know that you're in for a fight. You, you know, know what? We became big fans of Navarrete over the past five fights. Yeah. I was like, God dang, this kid can fight. Yeah, he can. Well, uh, I think with that being said, uh, Man, I'm I'm done. Who's your favorite fighter? You my yeah. favorite, you, okay. Mr. Question Asker. Okay, so my yeah. favorite. Okay, yeah, no, man. I got you. I got you. So my current favorite fighters right now, no order, okay. uh, would be Terrence Crawford. Uh, I would definitely put Virgil in there. You know, I, I think you know the sky's the limit with him. Uh, Canelo, uh, Pacquiao's still there, but you know it's kind of towards yeah. the tail end, obviously, and. I, he don't get out of sports soon. He's gonna be talking with Spence and Cal Brook and them guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gonna, he's gonna have that life alert going too. What's your who's your who's your who's your five, top five pound for pound? Oh, there you go. Right now, yeah. That way, we got to put you on the spot. Crawford, um, Limachenko, Canelo, Just like ours too. Um, the the other two that I'm gonna round out what are gonna be fuck. That's tough. Do you think Fury cracked it? Absolutely. I, I put Fury in the top five, and then I would say. That fifth spot's gonna be subjective, you know. Anyway, anyway? oh, you got Bevol. Bevol, beat or beat, beat her off, beat or beat. They <laughs> say his name. I can't get number five. I, I don't know. know how they say it. Beat or you beat got so many off. guys that well, that that whole. That's why I say that whole top five and top ten is if you got guys like Haney coming up and you got um, yeah, Haney could just. Haney, I mean, Haney I want to. I want to say. I want to say Spence. I know, but, Spence is in there. He's in that conversation. I want to say Spence, but the thing about it is, is like I just I think Sean Porter, you know. Gave him the business. I man. think Spence beat him. Yeah, no, guess, Spence won. Spence, Spence won, but I think Porter gave him the business. And, he did, and, and so it's, you know, but I mean Porter, he was tough. He was I still, I, I got a, a guy that not many people are gonna. I know James ain't going to, but I think uh, one of the more talented guys out there right now, who's I think his only loss was to Lomachenko, is Gary Russell. Oh yeah, Gary Russell's great. But see, I think when when I think the pound for pound list, I've always looked at it like. You know, yeah, you. Yeah. I I, 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 ba I base it off of not just, you know, the level of quality of fighters that they're beating, but I'm also basing it off of yeah. if, if they're dominant. In those it's completely wins. subjective. I mean, everybody yeah. has reason. But me and him has been arguing for what two years now. Who wins, I, Leo Santa Cruz or Gary Russell? I've been saying Leo Santa Cruz beats him. He has Gary Russell beating Leo. I do. I just think that is. I think I think that's volume a, beats counter tassel. punching any day. That's but you tassel. could all again and going back to the top, it's hard not to have Canelo number one. Look what the man's hard. Yeah, I would say Canelo's number one right now. Really? Yeah. You know, just because well, you. you know he he's pretty. Got you. He's been dominant. No, I, I still have Crawford. I, don't know. I mean, yeah, Crawford is great, and it's a, it's a tough it's call. Close. If it's somebody close. put Crawford number one, I'm not going to say they're crazy. I think Crawford could be number one, but Canelo, the weight classes and just jumping up like that. But and you got to look at the Rocky Fielding, the close fights he's had with Jacobs, the close fight with Golovkin. That's going to affect your pound. I don't, pound but you know what? The, the second fight with Golovkin, no, the, I, I don't really feel that them. was really but, that. But he's fighting them. He is fighting them, but, but, the, but the outcome is not what you would want from a pound-for-pound pound fighter. It was against um, the second Kovalev. Fight. Oh, the Kovalev. But look, we're dealing with Kovalev. You're dealing with an old Kovalev. Just because if we're going to go Crawford, and I, and I think Crawford's got the whole package, but where are you going to go on that? Look, at all, he's beat he's beat nine world champions. He's beat three Olympians. Just because they're not stars don't mean they're not great fighters. That's exactly what I'm going to say. I think with Crawford, I think he gets a, a hard time because, oh, he's not fighting the quote-unquote stars, but like really like he's he's beating you, quality you fighters. You better get that shit gritting smirk off your face because you know I'm right about that one. <laughs> but... Uh. It's true. We we both knew what not he was. Not true. We knew what Crawford was getting to last fight. We knew how good that kid was. We you're making you're making a, a rash fucking pick. You see what last I got minute in your I head. Gotta, you got to deal with him threatening all the way home. <laughs> I'm not threatening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it, but it is because Crawford's that good too. I mean, now your take is you're a guy that really. This is where we on a show where it makes it fun. A lot of people think that we always agree, no, we but don't. we don't. <laughs> and um, and he has really good points. But James is more of a guy like. 
show me who you fought and who you beat. And I'm a guy who likes to go over. I like to use oh. more of like the natural talent and who would win and like the fighter himself. Um, so that's why I really do have Crawford number one. And it's just one of the ones where if you say Canelo, I have no argument about that. Yeah. You know, just like the all time great. If you said Sugar Ray Leonard or Floyd Mayweather, no. I'm not going to call you crazy if you pick one over. So the then, other. who do, who do you pick in a fight with uh, Sugar Ray Leonard and Floyd Mayweather? I got Floyd. I got Sugar Ray. God damn, that's a tough one. But Sugar Ray could he could do it all. Like I said, he could box. He I'm gonna go with Sugar Ray. Slug. I'm gonna go with Sugar Ray. I uh, yeah. Tall, five ten. And he can move. He can move. He can move. I, I you know and I, I you maybe put Kelly on the spot. Ask him between him and Marvin Hagler. Who Kelly and Marvin Hagler? Who wins? Oh yeah, who wins? You <laughs> everybody's going to pick Marvin Hagler because he was in that era, but he's five nine, five eight, five eight, <laughs> and he wasn't a one punch power guy. So you would have got him out of there. Unfortunately, I, I like Marvin. <laughs> he's like unfortunately, <laughs> Marvin. Maybe, if you think of middleweight, you think of Marvin Hagler, you Bernard know, Hopkins. But I told Kelly too. I said, you know, the greatest fight for him, and they matched up height. Punch output power, Joe McClellan. Oh, yeah. well, you know, I've always felt, and maybe I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm in the minority. I've always felt Paul Williams could have beat Floyd. Really? Yeah, I really do. The height and everything, the volume, the, the, volume. the volume and the height, the distance. I, I could, I could see it. I would have never wanted that fight with Gerald McKellen. Why would you do that to me? I was just saying that you guys match up perfectly. <laughs> he had he, the one time. Who was the three guys that you picked? I was Mark, like, dude, if if uh, you had up to you, I, I would have been brain dead after the second fight. He had Gerald McClellan, <laughs> Triple G. No, it was um, <laughs> uh, what's his name, Hawk. Oh, Julian Jackson. Julian Jackson. Yeah, but Julian, you would have knocked out the chin. He, yeah, you took you know. Man, those are some power punches though. <laughs> God damn. It's not my body, it's his. I'm still feeling <laughs> effects from Edison Miranda. Hey, I really? Just, oh, he hit, man. Ho, ho. Is he the hardest hitter you've ever Oh, absolutely. Man. I did not tell you this right now. I never fought Triple G, but I have a good idea by watching the reaction of other people that he fought. <laughs> and it's not out of question. And people totally forget this. When Edison Miranda was coming up, he was he was the mo he was the boogeyman. Oh, yeah. And I he took that. you to Alan Green. He beat him, what he did to Abraham's Broke jaw. Edison Miranda hit you with a jab, your butthole puckered like that. You know what I mean? Like you carried that punch for five or six rounds. He hit that hard. There was that punch in the fifth round. Those three right hands, right? Yeah. And then I go back to the corner. Jack's like, what are you doing? What the fuck are you doing? I'm like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I, you hit me with the first one and my legs didn't move <laughs> for, the, for the next four. <laughs> do, you, do you recall how, how you were able to get the win over him? Yeah, dedicated. I went into that fight. Nobody gave me a chance in hell to do it <laughs> and um yeah and I, I went into that my my theory was because i was knocking everybody out and yeah. i was fighting legit guys coming up to ranks and um it was just that was the way i was taking them out and i knew my conditioning and so my game plan was with edison miranda Mar i didn't think miranda could fight going backwards miranda was dangerous when he was able to loop them punches from different angles that were hard to pick up mm -hmm. and that's when he caught people and especially like boxers who were trying to get out the way he would catch them so my game plan was like put the vest on and be prepared to go into a battle and i'm going to take shots and back him up and have him fight going backwards and make sure see if he could deal with my power and punch output and as we've seen he couldn't wasn't it you your know? dad who noticed he can't fight backing up yeah, my dad picked it what up. What round was it that you got? You, you got seventh. Seventh. Wow. Yeah, his dad. Knew it was the seven. He took a soul because he knew it was the same yeah, after that. It, it was, was the, a, the seven, seven, seven thing. You know, it was seventh round with Miranda, seventh round with uh, Jermaine Taylor, and then two thousand seven. Mm. Interesting. Should have played the lottery that night. <laughs> Should have picked three. <laughs> you did play the lottery when that check cash the next morning. That's the last question I'm going to ask because oh, I asked this to Mikey. No. That is the last question I'm going to ask. Why? What is? What is it with people's perception of fight oh, persons? Right? I thought you were going to go with something else that happened. No, no, no. I was the just perception saying, of people's fight persons when they see, oh, Kelly Pavlik's making four million for this fight. So why do they always assume that they're making four million? Like, there's the percentage that the they because they don't know. A lot of fans mm, they don't they don't know. they don't they don't have an idea of how the purses work and that's where a lot of these guys get hurt too like going back on that where I was fortunate with my dad being involved um, a lot of these guys I mean they're paying thirty to manager ten to trainer the money's just going out you know taxes. so right there is forty percent taxes and all that they don't have any they idea make a about dollars, that four hundred thousand so you yeah, know so Mike Mikey was telling me that. Off of Minnesota fight, he's making three hundred. Yeah, if he's 
tax free at that point. Let's mm-hmm. take home. And whereas where I was only giving away total for everybody, thirty percent. You know, Do you mind me asking and, what and, was your, and that, your highest take home? Yeah, and then my and that out of that thirty, what my dad started doing was okay. So at first, at the beginning of the career, everybody, I, I got to check and I got to full. If I fought for eight thousand, I got eight thousand, and then I had to go home cash that $8,000 check and then give everybody a separate check, you know? Gotcha. So I was getting taxed on the full eight. Mm. So what my dad started doing was when the, the big paycheck started coming in was he had top rank cut Jack his, then cut. So out of my total, Jack got his, um, Cameron got his, and then my dad would take 10% to bring down that amount gotcha. on my final check. So the taxes on it wouldn't be as high. And then what he would do is turn back around and cut me my 10%, which saved my ass big time. You know what I mean? He didn't keep nothing for himself. No, he didn't. So he bought my house that I originally lived in, and I'll, I'll throw a number out there. Just say if it was 70 grand at the house that I bought before I, before I won a title. Well, my whole thing was, as any kid, uh, young guy coming up, to get your parents when you make it, get them something because parents deserve, they do deserve it. Absolutely. You know, if you think about, if I gave my parents $2 million out of my $2 million purse, if I was to, that still don't add up from the time I was a baby from formula, doctor's appointments and every day, clothes, pencils, shoes, you name it. Parents, you know, they deserve it. They, Absolutely. they help you. And, um, but my, but my dad, you know, I, I wanted to give him the house. I wanted to get him out of the neighborhood that he was in. And uh, finally, I got him. I, I got him out, you know. And uh, he he gave me a check, and I was like, "No, Dad." And I, it was an envelope. I didn't even look at the amount. I was like, "No." I was like, "You know, this is." It. He goes, "Listen, I have no problem staying down there. So if you don't take it, I'm not taking this house." So I took it, and it was a good amount more than what I paid for the house. So I was kind of stuck on that, you know. Mm-hmm. I was like, "Well." Take it. But um yeah, he always did. He him and my mom helped tremendously. That house was no joke, was it? <laughs> I when I first moved from Oxnard to uh Ohio, I lived in that house, that little house. Kelly says, You can stay in my old house. I went over there first what was it, first night, gunshots went off, AK forty seven. Youngstown, <laughs> if you go look at the pull up Youngstown, it's uh it's a rough area. <laughs> but I mean if you don't mind me asking, what was your what was your biggest take home? Hopkins. Three. Hopkins. So yeah, take home three? Yeah. Wow. I wonder everybody knew him in Youngstown, right? Yeah. But you know what's funny? That t- nowadays it's nothing, is it? Yeah, it was funny. Um, after the t- uh, first Taylor fight, I got three that. Three million is nothing? No, compared to what they're making now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like, no, like, yeah. Three mil is still it's a good number. Yeah. Yeah. number. But after the first Taylor fight, yeah, I got home, and uh, because it, this, this is how I like going out. And I'm a last minute. <laughs> so if I have to get dressed up, I'm always like men's warehouse the day before I leave yeah. and my wife gets pissed at me she's like you procrastinate like come on you're almost 40 years old like pull your head out of your ass that's just the way I am and uh boy you had to see the looks when I was walking into Walmart two days after coming home from the world title fight where <laughs> the vindicator the local paper put the purse in there one million and in Youngstown people don't like we're just talking they're not paying attention to the money taken out and the, everybody else's uh purse and uh they're going to the people are just looking at me like why is he shopping here at Walmart and be honest with you, I wasn't even thinking about it. I was like, I just want to go in here and get some shit and, you know, go home. <laughs> and then everybody, that's, then that's when all the judging and all the eyeballs start following, like, everything you do. Oh, he, he's you at know? Walmart buying booze, yeah. right? <laughs> he's exactly. Broke. He's broke. Um, yeah, this is like two days after the fight. Um, I go, I like, now I go to the grocery store. Now, everybody knows me in Youngstown now in mean, a small area. But I, people kind of like, the one person goes, why you, why you do your own shopping? Well, I'll never forget, I, I bought me, because um, I like doing, like, the outdoor stuff. You know, like, I grew up in the city, so I got, I like doing a redneck thing, too. Like, I go out and cut my own grass. <laughs> so I bought me a 60-inch deck uh, riding lawnmower. It's cool as hell. And people were like, you cut your own grass? I was like, hell yeah. And I get on this thing, that's my little, like, get away from everybody. I ain't got to think about shit. I get my own head, and, and that's my relaxing time. And the first day I bought that, I, ha- I did have a grass cutting agency that came out to my house. And I'm a big kid. I really am. And um, <laughs> they they were cutting my grass. And Dew Cut came and delivered my lawnmower. And I ran out and I felt bad after, but I was so excited. I was like, stop, quit cutting my grass. You could go home. And I got on my lawnmower and started cutting the rest of it. You know what I mean? 
<laughs> paid off the final contract for the summer that I owed them and, and cut. You know what's funny, though, is there's things he can't, we can't do. Like, we rented a, a Nissan Maxima. Do you remember we rented that Maxima to, to go to fights? Because he don't drive his Mercedes. I mean, that's stupid. <laughs> and um, if he rents a Maxima, people say, oh, Kelly's driving a Maxima. He's yeah. broke. <laughs> Oh, it's, yeah. he bought, did you hear he bought a Maxima? He's broke now. And so it's all around. Everybody's talking about, I'm getting messages on my phone saying, why didn't you say that Kelly's broke? I said, You're dude, like, I don't got my hand in that man's pockets. Yeah. I said, it's a rental. <laughs> like hard times, right? No, because yeah. he rent, you know, why do you want to put miles on your own car? And everybody knows I own two gyms and I got this going, that going, but oh, he's got it's the Maxima. It's because he doesn't have the, 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 the shiny pendant. He doesn't have he's the a, bone pendant. I'm, I'm, you know, wait till I come out. You know, I'm already going right now. Me and Busy been talking. <laughs> And he's getting me. He's getting me uh, set up, and it's going to be off the wall, man. So there we go. You guys, right. you guys, you guys are going to have to put on, on like extra sweaters and hoodies because you're going to get frostbite when I come in with all that ice. It's gonna be, what is it? Cold in the D. Cold in the D. <laughs> cold in the D. All right, man. On that note, we're out, man. I appreciate it, man. Much love, Ghost. Thank you so much.